Hi, I'm Adam in Wales and this is my board gaming vlog and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about interaction in board games. Um, often interaction is considered to be an essential part of board games. Uh, uh, the, the, the interaction between the different players brings the game alive. Um, but I think if we look at competitive sports, you can see that that's not always the case. If we look at the difference between something like golf, where the players are essentially playing alone, uh, and a, a very sort of competitive team game, or even a one-on-one -on -one sort of battle like boxing or something like that, you can see that the degrees of interaction are there. Consider something like long jump in the athletics. There's no interaction whatsoever. Players are competing against their own personal best scores and also against the scores of the other players. And, and this is also the case in board games. We see that full range. So this video is going to look at 10 different degrees of interaction in board games. It's going to try and pinpoint what that interaction can be and what function it serves. So the first group of games are what are often called multiplayer solitaire and this is usually used as a pejorative term. It's usually a criticism of modern board games and particularly the Euro game genre. I'm going to show you one example to start us off. This is the game Dimension. In Dimension, each player has a board with a selection of coloured spheres. In each round, six rules are revealed, which dictate how the spheres can be placed. Players are then given one minute to simultaneously stack as many of their spheres as possible into a pyramid, without disobeying any of the rules. At the end of the round, each player scores their own pyramid, gaining points for using many spheres and losing points for breaking the rules on the cards. For example, certain colours may not be allowed to have anything on top of them. After six rounds, the player with the most points wins. So you can see that in Dimension, players are working on a puzzle. Yes, they all have the same puzzle and they're all trying to beat that puzzle, but ultimately their scores are completely independent of what any other player is doing. There is essentially no interaction in the gameplay itself within that game. Yet the, the, the puzzles themselves vary massively in difficulty depending on that card draw. There's a huge degree of randomness in whether this is an easy puzzle or a difficult puzzle. So without the context of competing against another player, the exercise itself becomes essentially meaningless. If you played this as a solo activity, on some rounds you'll score a really high score, on other rounds you'll score a really low score, and it won't necessarily be an indication of your level of skill. It'll come down to how the cards are played, you know, the randomness of that card draw. So really, only when you introduce another player do you have the context to actually determine how well you've done. Have you beaten that player or not? And the interaction essentially comes from sitting around a table and working on this puzzle together and then comparing your relative skill. Another couple of examples of true multiplayer solitaire games. Um, the game Mops Royal is a very simple example. This is similar to the game uh, Karuba that got quite a lot of buzz last year as it was nominated for the Spiel des Jahres. Here, each player is given a tile and everybody gets an identical tile, but then they work alone in building a sort of tableau of those tiles, trying to connect them up in order to score points. Um, in Karuba, they're using tiles to, to build paths to try and get to temples. But ultimately, no player interacts with each other in any way at all. It's simply a race to get the most points or to get to the desired location before any other player. Another classic example is the great game Ricochet Robots by Alex Randolph, uh, where a puzzle is laid out, a timer is turned over, uh, but actually the timer isn't turned over immediately. What happens is the players try and solve the puzzle in the minimum number of possible moves. When a player says, I can do it in this many moves, then the other player has a short period of time to try and equal that number of moves or beat it. Um, Completely solitaire, essentially the game is played in silence with people staring at the board, focusing a uh, great degree of concentration. But um, the, the, the fun comes in the, and the interaction comes in the frustration when you're almost there, you think you've almost got it, and then the other player gets it before you can. <laughs> and that's the, the frustration and that's where the laughter sort of comes from. So very little interaction in the gameplay, but the experience is interactive. The second group of games that I want to talk about are the cooperative games, and the main example I'm going to give you here is Flashpoint Fire Rescue. In Flashpoint Fire Rescue, each player takes on the role of a firefighter, attempting to save victims from a burning building. 
It's a cooperative game, so all players win or lose together. On a player's turn, they have a certain number of action points to spend depending on their role. They can use these points to move, to put out fires, to carry victims and to chop through walls. At the end of each player's turn, dice are rolled to determine the spread of the fire. Some areas contain explosives, and areas with multiple fire tokens are prone to chain reactions, which can consume the victims or even bring the building down. The game is won if the firefighters save seven out of the ten victims. So let's consider Flashpoint Fire Rescue as a two-player game. Essentially, we have player one, which is the team of firemen, and then we have player two, which is the game itself. Uh, which is randomly determined what that player does. Now, I think if you consider this as a two-player game in that way, you would see that it has a runaway leader problem. There's a snowball effect here. If the game, the fire and the house, if that player is doing extremely well, then they, their turns will get better and better and better as that fire spreads and more and more chain reactions. If the other player, the team of firefighters, if that player is doing well, then the fire is subdued and the player's turns get better and better and better. So you find you have wildly different experiences between two games of Flashpoint Fire Rescue. One game it'll be very easy, another game it'll be very difficult. And you don't have the context that we talked about in the multiplayer solitaire games where you can compare your performance against that of another player. All you can do is look at it and say, did we beat the game or didn't we? And some of that will be based on strategy and tactical thinking, but a lot of it will be based on the luck of the dice rolls or the luck of the card draw in a similar game like Pandemic or something like that. Um, other games, D-Day Dice has the same sort of dice rolling thing as we advance our soldiers up the beaches. And Pandemic The Cure, another cooperative game using dice. So often there's a heavy degree of randomness in this. I would say these are the true solitaire games. These are the games that you could play by yourself with no problems at all, taking control of all the different players um, and, and, and their actions. So essentially it is a puzzle um, and you don't have any context by which you can compare your skill level. Sometimes you'll beat it, sometimes you won't. That will be partly based on strategy and tactics, but a lot of it will be based on luck. So it's interesting to see where cooperative games are going now, and you're starting to see um, games trying to limit the information that certain players have, so that they really do have to interact with the other players and no one player can make all the decisions. Classically, cooperative games have been uh, plagued by this idea of what's called the, the alpha player syndrome, where one player makes all the decisions for the group. And that's inevitable in a game that is essentially a solitaire experience. Category three is, um, I suppose, what some people would call indirect interaction or passive interaction. But essentially what we're talking about here is accidental interaction, accidental blocking. And I could have used Ticket to Ride as the figurehead here, but I'm going to show you Takenoko. In Takenoko, players place tiles building a beautiful Japanese garden. The garden is home to an antagonistic gardener and panda double act. No player owns either of these characters, but all players have the opportunity to activate them on their own turn. The gardener causes bamboo to grow. The panda eats bamboo. Players attempt to complete three different types of objectives throughout the game. Gardener objectives require certain quantities of bamboo to be present in the garden. Panda objectives require the panda to have eaten certain types of bamboo. And plot objectives require the tiles to be placed in certain patterns. Throughout the game, players inadvertently help or hinder each other in achieving their secret objectives, and at the end of the game, the player with the most points wins. So in games with hidden objective cards, uh, players are working towards these objectives and the other players don't know what they're trying to do. They may be able to make some subtle guesses, but essentially they don't know. However, the games are built in such a way that players will inadvertently get in each other's way, and so the game becomes more difficult. However, nobody can really take offence. It's all done very friendly, because you, you can say, oh, I was going to go there, but nobody knew, so there's no bad feeling. No one's tried to mess up your plans. And in fact, you can even feel bad for each other and think, oh, that's unfortunate. And, you know, OK, you're advancing in the game, but you're not doing it and taking joy in the other person's sort of um, suffering through the game. Uh, so accidental blocking is a, 
a, a feature that happens in some Euro games, not as many as I as as I had imagined. Actually, I thought this was quite a large category, and when I started to think about it, I couldn't think of all that many games with hidden sort of objectives in them. There's games like um, Origin from Matagot. There's games like uh, Princess of Florence, that classic Wolfgang Kramer. Um, Euro game has hidden objectives and you can easily block other players without really knowing that you're doing it. And those are all enjoyable games. The next category I wanted to talk about is about deliberate blocking, uh, which is also called hate drafting, a term that came from Magic the Gathering. So the, the, the classic example is Agricola. So let's have a look at Agricola. In Agricola, each player is building their own farm on an individual player board. On their turn, they send workers to collect resources – wood, stone, sheep, cows, grain – or to take various actions – to build structures or sow fields or to renovate their home. If a player selects a certain action, then no other player can take that action on the same turn, and the resources which have accumulated on that space will no longer be available. At certain intervals, a harvest occurs. Fields produce more rations, animals breed, and critically, the farmer needs to feed their family. At the end of the game, points are scored for gathering the most resources and developing a farm with a diverse range of buildings, fields, animals and structures. So in Agricola, if I choose to draft an action, essentially if I choose to take an action space, nobody else can then use that action space. And most of the time, that can be done sort of pleasantly and constructively, but sometimes I might take an action space just to block somebody else. I don't even need that action, but I'm going to do it just to stop somebody else from using it. Um, this is Again, it's, it's often called indirect interaction. It's kind of a passive-aggressive interaction, but it's very, very deliberate. And you see it a lot in the card drafting games, like Seven Wonders. Um, Sushi Go Party is an example, or Sushi Go, where if I have a hand of cards, I can either choose to keep a card um, that I want, that's going to work towards one of my sets of cards that I'm building, but I'm going to have to pass the rest of my cards to the player to the left. And there may be cards in there that he really, really wants. So I might choose to actually take the card that the next player wants just so that uh, they don't get it. You know, even if I don't particularly need it, that's hate drafting. Okay, and it, it can cause um, quite sort of a, a bad feeling amongst some players. Some players don't like this sort of game where you can deliberately do somebody else down to no, no gain for yourself. So it's often called a sort of negative interaction. The next group I've called advance and attack. And what I mean by that is that the game is largely about doing something yourself, usually building something or constructing something for your own personal gain. But every now and then it may be beneficial for you to attack one of the other players and knock them down a little bit. Now, games do this to varying different degrees. Some games will have an awful lot of attack and a little bit of advancement. If you think about a game like King of Tokyo, um, yes, you're, you're, you're trying to win the game by scoring a certain number of victory points, so that's your own personal advancement, but you're going to spend a lot of the game beating other players down, and actually that's the main thing you think of when you think of the game, is more about the attack. Other games will have an awful lot of, uh, of sort of advancement, a lot of building and, 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 and developing your own stuff with just the occasional little attacks that you can make, perhaps a, a card you know, which you can play on another player to steal some of their stuff or knock down one of their buildings. Um, so let's have a look at the game Evolution. This one features a good sort of even mix of the two, I would say. In Evolution, each player develops a series of species throughout the game. On a player's turn, they're given cards, which can be used in several different ways. They can spend the cards to create new species, or to increase the body size or population of an existing species. Or they can enhance the traits of one of their species. And this is the crux of the game. Because at the end of each round, species need to feed in order to survive. And food is often scarce. Added traits might just allow a species to jump the queue for food at the watering hole, or to find food from another source, or even to turn carnivore and feed on the species of another player. Additionally, traits can be used to develop defences against carnivores. Shells, camouflage, climbing, burrowing. 
And at the end of the game, the player whose species ate the most food wins. So the game Evolution is actually my favourite game at this point. It's the, it's the game I've enjoyed the most. I love the way the theme uh, is, is integrated into the game. I love the player interaction here and the way the sort of stories throughout the game develop. But it's not always my, uh, my favourite sort of genre of games, this advance and attack thing. I particularly don't like it when the attacks feel like they're kind of tacked on, that most of the time we're just left alone to build our own stuff and then every now and then somebody can just destroy what I was doing. I find that deeply frustrating in quite a lot of games. Um, other examples here, uh, the game Dice Town, you know, often you're just gathering gold, gathering money, but every now and then you're going to want to steal something from somebody else if you have the appropriate card. In uh, the game Abyss, again, a brilliant sort of Euro game uh, and, and, and largely about building and constructing and developing a tableau and an engine, but you might just choose to take the sort of aggressive strategy and there's a certain colour of card that you're going to aim for if you want to take that particular route. In a game like um, Tigris and Euphrates, you're going to be forced to interact from time to time. You can kind of turtle away in one corner and just build up your civilization in the corner of the board, but eventually the board is going to get too crowded, you're going to have to interact, and you're going to have to attack the other players. Um, although the game doesn't really sort of it doesn't benefit you to be involved in too many of those battles. So the game sort of encourages you to, to play constructively and only attack when you really need to. So these are all games in that genre that I really, really like. But as I say, it can be problematic when those attacks come, they're unexpected and they undo a lot of the work that you've been doing over a number of turns, that can cause quite a lot of bad feeling. And I must admit it's not something I enjoy myself. The next category is all-out attack. So just games that are entirely based on doing your opponent down. There's nothing constructive, there's nothing positive, the game is entirely negative interaction. If my opponent is having a bad time, then I'm enjoying myself. Okay, if my opponent is struggling and suffering, then I'm doing well, I'm winning the game, and I'm happy. That's what these games are aiming for. And I'm going to use a slightly unusual example, because I don't have many of these games. I'm not a huge fan of massive attacking. So the example I'm going to give is the game Wrestling, an old Avalon Hill game from uh, 1990, which I played a lot as a teenager. I absolutely loved it as a teenager. I played it constantly throughout my school years. Um, it's... It's got, got some problems, it needs a bit of updating and modernising, uh, but I think it's an interesting one to look at, so let's have a look at Rasslin. In Rasslin, each player controls a wrestler parodying the famous wrestlers of the late 80s and the early 90s. The wrestler has statistics for strength, agility, skill, weight and stamina, which dictate the cards they're able to play and the damage they can inflict on their opponents. On a player's turn, they play a card from their hand representing a wrestling move. Their opponent now has an opportunity to play a block or a reverse card if they have one. Otherwise, they take damage. And crucially, their statistics are reduced, making it harder for them to play cards themselves. Recovery cards are critical in the game, allowing players to regain health. But knowing when to use these, along with the blocks and the reversals, is the key decision in winning the game. Ultimately, a timely pin card, or speciality move, or submission will end the match and determine the winner. Of course, this genre of all-out attack encompasses a lot of the, um, the abstract games. Things like chess and stuff like that, those, those abstract strategy games, are entirely about advancing and destroying your opponent. Uh, same with games like Yinch and the whole of that sort of GIF series, which are the, the, the modern sort of uh, gold standard for abstract games, I would say. But equally, we get into the large sort of box war type combat heavy games like Fantasy Flight's entire catalogue. No, that's not quite true, there are some Euro games in there. But Imperial Assault would be an example of a game where we are essentially trying to win the game by destroying the other person's forces. Uh, you can play this uh, with a little team going against one other player who plays, so, so you might have a team of four people playing against one bad guy, or you can play it one-on-one, -on -one, which is the way that I tend to play the game, in which case it becomes a game of just, just attack. There's no constructive stuff in here, there's no positive interaction, it's entirely negative. But it's a lot of fun because you go into the game knowing that. It's not like those games where the negative interaction comes as a surprise and undoes a lot of the good work that you've been doing building your engine. This is all out negative and you know that going in. 
I think the categories we've looked at so far are part of a broad spectrum, so games will sit somewhere on that spectrum. They may not slot into one category or another, but they'll be somewhere in that range. And that's what pe we're talking about when we're talking, when people criticise things for multiplayer solitaire or for being too attacky, too sort of direct in their confrontation and their interaction. Um, a game that commonly gets uh, criticised for being multiplayer solitaire is Dominion. And I think you can agree, it's, it's not multiplayer solitaire in the same sense as something like Ricochet Robots or um, you know Dimension that we talked about earlier. In this game, we are competing to buy cards from a common card pool. So if I'm buying stuff and I empty a pile, that impacts on my opponents. Um, there's also a race element to it, which which is uh, you know shared with those multiplayer solitaire games. But we also have these attack cards, which just slow our opponents down. This is more of an advance and attack sort of game. So yeah, largely it's constructive about building an engine, but every now and then we play something that just slows our opponents down a little bit. It's not truly multiplayer solitaire, and the interaction is about sharing the time around the table with friends. Our next few categories take us off that spectrum and into other areas of interaction in board games. So the first one that I wanted to talk about was negotiation games. Um, so the example that I'm going to give is the game Dragon's Gold. In Dragon's Gold, four dragon cards are laid out on the table and each has a strength value and a certain amount of treasure that it's guarding. Players have a set of four adventurer cards of differing values, and on a player's turn, they play one of these adventurers alongside a dragon. When the combined total of all the different players' adventurers at a dragon card equal the dragon's strength, then that dragon is defeated, and its treasure is distributed among the players, contributing to the dragon's demise. Players must agree on the exact distribution of the treasure within 60 seconds, and if they can't agree, then no one gets anything. So players negotiate ruthlessly in order to get the treasure that they want, because at the end of the game, players are going to score points for accumulating sets of different treasures, for gathering the highest value treasures, and for holding the majority in each colour of treasure. The player with the most points when all the treasure's been divided wins the game. In Dragon's Gold, the negotiation is fierce, and it's quite nasty, and again, it can cause bad feeling, because a particularly bullish player can really, uh, can, you know, can really push the other players and make them feel quite uncomfortable. They can refuse to do deals, and if so, the whole thing collapses. So you can really feel you're being bullied in this game. You need to play it with people you trust, people you like, uh, people who aren't going to get offended, and then you can have a lot of fun with a game like this. But it's not for the, for the faint-hearted, that's for sure. Um, other games with negotiation, I suppose there's things like Sheriff of Nottingham, where you're bribing and you're trying to convince the player not to open the bag. Don't open the bag, I'm going to give you some money so you don't open my bag. You're lying, you're bluffing, and you're, you're sort of wheeling and dealing your way through the game. A ton of interaction in a game like this, but not in the form of attacks. This is all about negotiation, bribery, and trying to better your position um, through those sort of those skills. The gift of the gab, you know, having having the patter to to, to get yourself uh, through and charm the other players, and then at the end show them that you'd actually betrayed them all. Closely related to the negotiation games are the social deduction games, and there have been a ton of these over recent uh, recent years. I'm going to show you the example of Spyfall. In Spyfall, each player is given a card. All but one player will have a matching card, and these cards indicate the location that the players are at. The remaining player has a different card. This one says only spy, and no one knows what cards everyone else has got. Hence, the spy player doesn't know what location everybody is at. The spy player wins the game if they can determine what the location is, but the other players will win collectively if they can determine who the spy is. On your turn, you ask a question to another player. This should be something vague enough not to give away the location, but relevant enough to let the other players know that you know, that you're one of the players who knows what the location is. If you are the spy, you're going to have to ask a question anyway, and you're going to have to do it confidently, although you really know very little. Over several turns, the spy is going to listen to the questions that are being asked and hopefully deduce what the location is. Or they might be required to ask a question themselves and give themselves away dramatically with a question that's completely irrelevant 
and makes everybody else sort of laugh at them and scorn them for their, their idiocy. So Spyfall is a very specific example of this type of genre, and it is almost creating a genre in itself. It was followed by a game called Fake Artist in New York, where you're drawing pictures, but one person doesn't know what you're supposed to be drawing. And I've already seen from the, the, the sort of preview of Essen Spiel 2016 that there are many games using the same sort of gameplay of one player not knowing what's going on. Um, but Traditionally, the games, the social deduction games are based off that game Werewolf, where some players are werewolves, others are villagers, and no one knows quite who's who. You don't know who's on your team. So, uh, The Resistance was a great example of it, and in this case, The Resistance Avalon, other ones I have, Animals Frightening Night, um, and the game Time Bomb, which is a very small, very simple social deduction game that's being released by various companies at Essen this year in different editions. There's a Cthulhu version, um, there's, there's like fantasy medieval type versions, there's all sorts of stuff going on with Time Bomb. I think it's going to be a popular game. Also related to the negotiation category are the auction games, and many games will fe feature auctions as a form of interaction. Uh, I suppose the purest auction games I tend to think of are For Sale and Modern Art. So let's have a look at For Sale. In a round of For Sale, a series of property cards are placed on the table with differing values. Players bid to purchase these cards in a turn-based auction. If they do not wish to bid, they take the lowest valued card and they pay half their current bid to take it. Hence, each player will purchase a card in each round of the game. Once all properties have been purchased, then the second half of the game begins. And in this half of the game, a number of checks are placed on the table each round. Players play one of their property cards face down and then they all reveal. And the highest valued property gets the highest valued check. The second highest gets the second highest check. And so on until everyone has taken a check. Once all the checks have been taken, then the player with the highest value combined from all their checks wins the game. For Sale is a very simple game, um, and the only interaction really is in, in, in trying to outbid each other. Modern Art takes this to another level, and uh, this is a Rainer Knizia game, and it features several different types of auctions, and a lot of mathematics and trying to work out what things are worth and what people have got and that sort of stuff. Um, so the interaction in there is all about the auction, bidding outbidding other players. And then you see this mechanic uh, incorporated into bigger games like Power Grid and Pr Princes of Florence where players are, are, are bidding over, um, over different items that they're going to then add into their, their engine, add into their building um, to, to sort of further them in the game. So the final category of interaction on this list, and I think the most important one of all, is about personal interaction around the table outside of the game, and this is what the party game genre does exceptionally well. So let's have a look at the game Pluck in Pairs. In Pluck in Pairs, 11 picture cards are placed onto the table, and then a 90 second timer is turned over, and all players simultaneously write down the images that they can see, putting them into pairs according to common themes or relationships, etc. The reason for pairing doesn't have to make sense. It can be as tenuous as you like. And one card is going to be left out because there are 11 cards and these things have to go into pairs. After 90 seconds, each player reads out their chosen pairs and their odd one out, and they score points if the other players have selected the same pairs and the same odd one out. After six rounds, the player with the most points wins. What you find in Pluck in Pairs is that the gameplay itself doesn't sound that fascinating, but when you play it and people have to justify why they partnered these two things together, and then you find that someone else around the table has come to exactly the same weird connection that you did, there's so much sort of joy and laughter in that, so much satisfaction. Um, yeah, the, the components are cheap looking and it all looks a little bit naff, but it's hilarious fun. And, and the interaction is the laughter the fun, the getting to know each other, and you see that in, in many of these party games, whether it's um, telestrations where you're drawing pictures and passing around the table and people are trying to guess what you've drawn, or um, Time's Up, uh, which is that old public domain game where you, you, you have names and you, 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 you draw a name and then you have to, um, initially, you have to describe it, and then in the second round you have to use one word, and then in the third round you have to mime it. And, and it, it's just... The, the game itself has very little interaction, really there's interaction between you and your partner. That's it. Nobody else is interacting with you. But 
Everyone's laughing, everyone's having fun, everyone's chatting, and that's the real interaction that goes on. And I think this is what people are missing when they criticise games for being multiplayer solitaire. Sometimes I want to play a game that is heavily interactive in terms of the gameplay mechanisms. Sometimes I want to do that. Often I want to do that. But sometimes I just want to sit down, spend some time with somebody without the stress of that. And, and yeah, we can loosely compete in terms of seeing who's got the most points or something like that. But essentially that's not the important bit. The important bit is that we're sat in the same space, doing the same activity, enjoying that time together. Um, and I think that's where the multiplayer solitaire the advance and attack and the and the sort of subtle sort of passive interaction of that accidental blocking where those categories really come into their fore and I think that's why you see a lot of those sort of games in the gateway sort of uh, the gateway category of games the games for beginner players um, because it removes that chance of somebody just destroying you on your you know you, 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 your first game and they, they wipe you out and they enjoy it they they get great pleasure from doing you down so in a lot of these games that doesn't happen and I think that's where uh, the pleasure comes in anyway thank you for watching this video I hope you've enjoyed it if you did please watch some of my other videos and subscribe to my channel Adam's Board Game Wales or follow me on Twitter at Board Game Wales on Board Game Geek I'm Adam78 Thank you very much for watching. All the best.